Uh, the first talk uh, this morning is about bone loss and shoulder instability. Uh, this is my disclosure. As you know, the uh, patient with anterior instability oftentimes have a bony lesion of the granite and the heel sacs lesion. In our series, 86% of them had a granite bony defect and 94% of them had heel sacs lesion. And in total, 81% had both of these lesions together. So we call it bipolar lesion. So four out of five patients with anterior instability have bipolar lesion. So it's very common and we have to deal, it, deal them uh, properly. So what's wrong with the granular bony defect? We created the bony defect stepwise in a cadaveric model like this and then we repair the bankard lesion then the stability with the arm at the end range of motion was not deteriorated at all. However, the stability at the mid range of motion decreased significantly after repairing the bankard lesion if the bony defect is this large. So the bony defect of the granule is this. If you repair the bankard lesion, then even with a large bony defect, the humeral head is stable in the granular socket at the end range of motion because the capsule is tight, which prevent the anterior translation of the head. However, if you bring the arm to the mid range, then the capsule becomes lax. Then it doesn't hold the head anymore. So the head starts to slide anteriorly because the socket is shallow due to the large bony defect. So the granular bony defect is related to the, the mid-range instability, not at the end-range instability. On the other hand, the heel sacs lesion has nothing to do with the mid-range instability, but when the arm is at the end range, if the heel sacs lesion is covered by the granoid, it's safe. It causes no instability. However, if the heel sacs lesion is larger than the granite socket, then it engages and dislocation occurs. So the heel sacs lesion is related to the end range instability. This is an important concept for us to understand. What is the critical size of the granite defect? It's uh, quite straightforward because the bony defect of the granite determines the mid range instability independent of the heel sacs lesion. There are several biomechanical and clinical studies showing that the critical size of the granule defect is 25% of the granule width, which is equivalent to 20% of the granule length. What about heel sacs lesion? It's a little more complicated because it's not the pure size of the heel sacs lesion that matters, but the relative size of the heel sacs lesion to the granule. That is the most important thing. Take a look at this uh, left, uh, left heel sacs lesion. This is totally covered by the granoid, so it causes no instability. However, the same heel sacs lesion causes instability if there is a bony defect of the granoid. So we have to look at the both lesion at the same time. So how can we assess the risk of heel sacs lesion in a clinical setting? There are two methods. One is dynamic examination. During arthroscopic operation, you may bring the arm to abduction, external rotation, and you see there is an engagement. So you think this is an engaging heel sacs lesion, and you say, let's do arm plissage. But that's not the correct way, because before the bank repair, the humeral head is unstable, basically, to the anterior direction. So with the arm at the end range, then the head shifts anteriorly, and this heel sacs lesion causes engagement. However, after the bank on repair, the shoulder is stable. It doesn't shift anteriorly. So this heel sacs lesion does nothing to the instability. So this is not the true engaging heel sacs lesion. But the true engaging is this. Even after the bank on repair, it engages and dislocates. So this is something we need to find and we need to treat. But if you look at the literature, you'll be surprised that there are so many investigators, almost all of them, 
do this dynamic examination before bank card repair. And as a result, one third to almost one half of the patient showed engaging heel sex lesion and they performed one massage. This is obviously an over-treatment. There's on, only one report in which they performed dynamic examination after the bank card repair. Out of 1,000 arthroscopic bank card repair, Park and colleagues found that 7% of them showed engagement after the bank card repair. But the problem of this procedure is there is a risk of damaging the repair. You repair the bank card and bring the arm to end range, you may break your repair. So in order to avoid this risk, we recommend to the second method, use the glenoid track concept. What is glenoid track? It's the area of the humeral head covered by the glenoid when you move the arm along the posterior end range of motion. If the heel sex lesion stays within this track, it should be okay. So first, in a kinetic model, we look at where the glenoid track is. With the arm in maximum external rotation and maximum horizontal extension, we elevated the arm from 0, 30, up to 60 degrees. And as you see here, the glenoid moved along the posterior articular surface of the humeral head, creating a zone of contact. We call this zone the glenoid track. So if the heel sac lesion stays here, there's no chance at all that the anterior rim of the glenoid, which is here, engages with this heel sac lesion. No chance at all. However, if the heel sac lesion is here, then there's a risk of engagement at this zone. The glenoid track is created by the glenoid itself. So when the glenoid is intact, it's the widest. If there is a bony defect, then the glenoid track becomes narrow. So we want to know where the, glano, the medial margin of this glenoid track is. So we measure the width of the glenoid, which is 100%. Then the medial margin of the glenoid track is 84% from the medial margin of the uh, footprint of the rotator the cuff. If there's a bony defect like this, then we need to subtract this length to obtain the true glenoid track width. Next, we measure the glenoid track in live shoulders with the arm in maximum external rotation and horizontal extension. We move the arm up and down along the posterior end range of motion. Then we took the MRI and created this 3D skeletal model. And finally, we fixed the humerus and let the glenoid move on the humeral head. So this is the glenoid track observed in live shoulders. So using this technique, we measure the location or width of the glenoid track, which was 83% with the arm at 90 degrees of abduction, which becomes a little narrow superiorly and a little wide inferiorly. So how can we apply this in our clinical setting? We need 3D image of the glenoid of bilateral shoulders. Don't worry about the radiation, because if you ask the radiologist to take the CT of right shoulder, the data of the left shoulder is already in there because the, both shoulders are in the gantry. So all you need to do is ask the radiologist to create the 3D image of not only the involved shoulder, but also the unaffected, intact shoulder as well. So this is what we obtain. The intact shoulder, intact glenoid, we measure the 83% length and then we bring this to the other side. And in this case, there's a bony defect here. So we measure the width of the bony defect and subtract this width from the 83% length to obtain the true width of the glenoid track. This is the heel sac lesion. This is the med medial margin of the footprint. And you bring this here, and you see that in this case, the heel sac lesion is covered by the glenoid track. So as I said before, the, the word engaging heel sac lesion is confusing and sometimes erroneously used. So in order to avoid this confusion, we propose a new terminology. This heel sac lesion is out of the glenoid track, so it causes engagement. So we used to call it engaging heel sac lesion. 
that instead of using this confusing word, we propose to use the new terminology of track Hillsax lesion, because this lesion is off the glomerular track. And this Hillsax lesion stays on the glomerular track, so instead of saying non-engaging Hillsax lesion, we propose to say on track Hillsax lesion. So how often do we see off track Hillsax lesion? In our series, we found 7%. This prevalence was exactly the same as the Parks report using dynamic examination. So it's not something like 30, 40, 50 percent. It's 7 percent. So how to treat this off-track Hillsax lesion? There are two methods. One is to fill this defect either by the bone graft or remplissage. The other method is to fill this glenar bony defect with a bone graft, which will make the glenar tract wider. And the bone graft and the rampassage are commonly performed, but they are very different from the biomechanical viewpoint. If you perform bone graft, then if you want, want to move the, the, uh, the arm along the posterior end range, range of motion, the glenar can move over this grafted bone. However, if you perform ramp massage, then the heel sac lesion becomes extra articular. So the granule cannot move over the heel sac lesion. It has to move around the heel sac lesion. So the granule tract is significantly distorted after ramp massage. So there should be some limited range of motion. We measure the range of motion using cadavers and we found that there was a significant decrease in the horizontal extension as well as external rotation. So if the patient is a throwing athlete, we cannot recommend this procedure. So this is our treatment strategies. If the Hillsax region is on track and the glenoid defect is small, don't worry about bony defect, just fix the soft tissue. On track heel sacs and the large glenoid defect, then we have to fix the glenoid either by lateral J or something else, either bone graft. For the off track heel sacs region small glenoid, this is the best indication for long glissage, but if the patient is a throwing athlete or a collision athlete, you might want to perform lateral J. That is okay because by performing lateral J, you can convert off-track heel sex lesion to on-track heel sex lesion without touching the heel sex lesion. For the off-track lesion, large glenoid defect, we always have to fix the glenoid. So this is our treatment strategy, and how often do we see this? In our series of 100 cases, 93% of them were on-track small glenoid defect. So we just perform arthroscopic bank of repair. What about this on-track lesion, uh, large glenoid defect in our series, 0%. Theoretically, this exists. However, if the glenoid defect is more than 25%, then the glenoid tract is very narrow, and all the hip sacs lesion are off-track. There's no such case as on-track hip sacs, large glenoid defect. So in other words, if the hip sacs lesion is on-track, don't worry about the bony defect, just fix the banker lesion. And the off-track uh, heel sacs and the small granule, this was 5%, and the off-track large granule defect, this was 2%. So these 7% of the cases, we have to think about that. So in summary of my lecture, the bipolar bony lesion is very common. Four out of five patients with anterior instability have the bipolar lesions. And for the glenoid defect, it is related to mid-range instability independent of hip sacs lesion. So we can precisely determine the, the critical size of the glenoid defect, which is 25% of the glenoid width. On the other hand, hip sacs lesion is related to end-range instability, which is dependent on the glenoid size. So, don't look at the heel sacs lesion alone, but we have to look at both lesions at the same time. For that purpose, we propose to use the glenoid track. If the heel sacs lesion is on track, then don't worry, just fix the soft tissue. 
This is 93% of the cases. If the hue sacs lesion is off track, then look at the glenoid. If the defect is large, then fix the glenoid by lateral gel, for example. If the defect is small, then you can do either rumpled sarge or lateral gel, depending upon the activities of the patients. Thank you very much for your attention.